Scotland's energy mix. As the conflict in Ukraine deepens our cost of living crisis, should we allow a new age of North Sea oil and gas or just stick with the push to renewables? And living with COVID, how concerned should we be by rising cases? Russia's invasion of Ukraine has sent global oil and gas prices soaring, driving UK petrol and diesel costs already at record levels to new highs. Meanwhile, we're being warned that the average household could soon be paying more than £3,000 a year in energy bills. Responding to the crisis, the Prime Minister is promising a new energy security plan, which could involve a ramping up of North Sea oil and gas production. His strategy is also is expected to include more nuclear power and renewable energy. We discussed the country's energy mix with Professor Paul Delu, Director of Robert Gordon University Energy Transition Institute and the climate campaigner and blogger Laura Young. Uh, Paul, so how much is the conflict in Ukraine adding to the rise in energy prices in the UK? Yeah, the, the horrific situation that plays out in Ukraine has kind of a worldwide impact. I mean, again, since shockwaves are out, you can see on the back of this, oil prices up to a kind of almost a 14 year high, uh, touching almost $40 a barrel, absolutely incredible, but gas prices even more so. So if you look at the gas price on energy equivalent, it went almost up to $600 a barrel equivalent. So huge amount of increase, levels we have never seen before. And of course, when you see these prices, these are wholesale prices that goes directly back in what we see on the four courts if we fill up our cars. Yeah. And of course, what we pay for our domestic heating as well. It's because everywhere in society, these prices are gonna come filtered through in some shape or form. And, and Paul, in the light of that, in the light of that, does it make sense that Boris Johnson is going to set out, set out his energy independent security plan? Does it make sense to be reviewing our energy mix? I think it is critical because what we find ourselves in the situation in now is that we have almost three things happening at the same time, a real true energy dilemma. We've got a security of supply issue. We've got an affordability crisis. And of course, we've got a climate emergency and a climate crisis on top of it. So we need a plan that addresses all three of these things so that we make sure that when we come out, we actually have energy people can afford. We have a kind of security in this country. So we are at the beginning of a pipeline, not the end of a pipeline, and actually be dealing with the climate emergency all in one go. This needs a plan, this needs commitment, this needs a different way of operating. Um, Laura, are you concerned that there's going to be a, a renewed push for oil and gas exploration in the North Sea because of all of this? I am concerned and I think we need to be really mindful that even in a situation like this to remember the advice of the International Energy Agency which is we cannot afford globally in terms of the climate crisis to be doing new exploration for oil and gas and so I hope this situation is one that actually galvanises our push to be more renewable and more self-sufficient with the energy that we produce here at home but also recognise that there's a need to close the gap and really look at our consumption and how we can reduce our consumption as well so that we aren't you know really facing this cost of living as individuals but also energy crisis as a whole. Uh, Paul which way do you think this is going to go do you think there's going to be a, a push for more exp uh, more oil and gas exploration? I mean the reality is is we will need fossil fuels in the interim the moment the UK kind of consumes more gas than we actually get from the North Sea. So we have a choice. We're either, as Laura said, taking a mound down, which is really tough to do. And if we can't do that, we're going to have to get the gas from somewhere. Now, we have a choice. We either develop it ourselves or we import it. Now, import is expensive. And actually, import, particularly from liquefied natural gas, comes at emissions way higher than we can produce ourselves. So actually, I think the rule book has changed. What has, and we need to start thinking very differently around how we fill the energy gap that we have affordable energy for people here, including options, development on the doorstep here at the North Sea, which we can control. We can actually build a capability and we can use this capability to accelerate the energy transition. So I think it's a critical part of the energy strategy. Well, what's your response to that? Paul saying it's, you know, we would have control if we did it in, in the North Sea and we wouldn't have to import it. 
I think we still need to talk about, though, the responsibility that we have to be moving away from oil and gas much quicker than we are. But in the short term, do we not need to do something like this? We do, and I think that's where we can also have the conversation about how we can drastically reduce the amount we are using. We need to be looking at not just energy in terms of oil and gas, but we need to look at where are we wasting energy, wasting energy in our homes through insulation or lack thereof, double glazing, look at our transport, how we can get people out of their cars and onto different modes of public transport. We need to be looking at the whole picture and not just thinking how we switch from imported oil and gas to our own oil and gas, but look at this overall in a holistic way. What would you think about that, Paul? Looking at cutting our energy consumption, looking at rather than looking at getting more oil and gas. I, mean, I think Laura's absolutely right. I think the best way to deal with it is to cut our consumption, but that's no easy thing to do. And just again, bring the context. We have around 40 million vehicles on the road in the UK at the moment. Most of them actually are diesel or petrol vehicles. We've got 23 million homes using uh, natural gas, and an awful lot of homes also using uh, LPG oil. We can't switch this over. It's not happening just like that. So even if we want to change behaviors, we want to kind of use heat pumps, you know, district heating, all of this going to take years to do. So it's the right outcome, completely agree with the destination, but the journey is going to be more difficult. We do need to make sure we keep all options on the table, which includes using fossil fuels as a bridge to the new future. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're coming back to this point. It's not going to happen overnight, Laura. But things that can ho happen overnight are things like we can get insulation into people's homes. We can get people on the track for moving into active and public transport. We can do these things and we can do them really quickly. But also we need this opportunity to be what gets us there. We've argued for years that we're not doing this quick enough. And this is just another step in the direction that we need to go in. And we just need to use it to move faster. What about a nuclear power, Paul? Should we be making more use of that? So, I mean, I think the, the key driver is find a way where we can accelerate the renewable business. We got an enormous gift to the nation. It's called offshore wind and onshore wind. I mean, the UK is extraordinarily well positioned, so we need to use that. We use, need to use that as fast as we can. But of course, wind is give you a problem because if the wind doesn't blow, we don't have the energy. So we do need base load as part of the mix. So I think as we kind of replumb and rewire the United Kingdom and its energy system, I think there's a role for a diverse energy supply, including very light wind, hydrogen, but also a role for nuclear as being a base load to make sure we always have the security of supply and the electricity we need for all the consumers in the country. Um, nuclear power? I don't think it should be our priority. to go down that route and I guess there's it's more the justice angle that I come at it from I think Scotland as a developed nation have a responsibility to be investing in energy that other places particularly in the global south can be taking on we've seen over the last two decades the price of renewable energy and infrastructure plummet making it much cheaper and accessible and that's not going to happen with nuclear it's not something that's going to become cheaper it's also not something that can be scaled down it's not something that can be done at a community level, it's not something that can be community owned, whereas renewables can be. And so I think it's more of a justice issue that I think it's not the path we need to go down mm. and we need to focus and, on those renewables. And Paul, nuclear is a harder sell, isn't it, to, for many people? Yeah, and again, we, we always talk about nuclear as the very huge big stations very in the remote areas. But the future of nuclear can be very different. There's a lot of new technology being, in, uh, being progressed around small mu nuclear reactors, which are very much smaller, very much more compact, and it can be far closer to where the, the, uh, the, the mouth is. Of course, have a, 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 a very good safety record to go with it. So it's part of an energy mix. But I completely with Laura that the real price here is is regeneration. That is kind of the it okay. is the absolute thing we can go after, but okay. it needs to be balanced with base loads okay. because we do need something um, we'll vital. To, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you both very much indeed for joining us this thank evening. You. Thank you.